All right, turn with me in your Bibles. Turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 5 and verse number 14. James chapter 5 and verse number 14. James chapter 5 and verse 14 is where we are. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This afternoon I want to preach on prayer. What prayer is and how prayer is answered. Some of what I'll say will be familiar, but some of it will be unconventional. Because God's will for every one of our lives is to have answered prayer. So when the Bible speaks of prayer, it doesn't just speak of prayer in the sense that it is an activity that you perform. Actually, prayer in the Bible is something where you and I acquire what we need in this life. Prayer has many forms and many types in the Bible. But one of the primary ways that we acquire in this life is by our prayers for another person. In other words, when God wants to work in your life and in your family and in your country, he will do it through prayer. Prayer is the cry of of a soul to the Father, the communication of the soul in an intimate and close relationship. So as we talk and listen and communicate, God begins to use our prayers to accomplish his will and his purpose in our lives. So this evening, this afternoon, I want to speak on prayer and how our prayer can change not only our own life, but those of those, the life of those that we love. Let's, let's pray together first. Father, I pray now that you would help me as I preach. I'm praying, Father, that you would use your word in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would still our spirits, and I pray that spiritually we'd be open to thy truth. I pray that you would use your spirit in our lives now. So, Lord, we ask for a special endowment, a special blessing from you tonight. Lord, speak and move among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we pray, we have an ability to influence that is way, way beyond any other thing that we do in another person's life. When we pray, we have the ability to change a life. We have the ability to influence a life in a way that we never can without prayer. So to begin with, how do we pray? Well, the very foundational principle of prayer is that we are always praying to a destination. So when we pray, we are always praying to the Father. Now that sounds overly simple, that we pray to the Father. However, it is not. It is something that is an actual foundation in the Bible. The Father is the object to our prayer. There are some religions that teach you pray to a saint or through a saint or to a person who has gone before or to an angel. But the Bible never says that. There are no examples in the Bible of prayer that are offered to directly a person or to an angel. All prayer is directed to the Father. Every one of Jesus' prayers, every one of the disciples' prayers, everyone, 100%, are directed to to the Father or to the Son. Uh, occasionally, as the Son, usually it's in an inter intermediary sense, but it is directed to the Father. Now look back in James chapter 5 and verse number 14. Notice what he says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders, the mature men of the church, and let them pray over him. Notice he's telling them to pray for him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then he says in verse number 16, Confess your faults one to another. In other words, 
Let there be an openness and transparency and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So he is telling us that we need to be in the, in the habit and the life of praying for another person. I mean, that needs to be the consuming passion of your life, where we become intercessors, where we become the one that God uses, whom God power flows through to bring a blessing into the life of another person. I don't know that we really accept the fact that we can do more for a person through our prayer than through our works. It's not that we shouldn't do our works, but it's almost like giving a spoonful of food to a starving man, not giving him the meal. It's like putting a coat on a child on a cold winter day, but denying him the ability to come into the house where he can get warm. The things that we do are surface things. They're not foundational things. They don't change the heart and modify the life like a prayer can change a person's life. We do more by our prayer than by any other thing that we do. So if we want to change another person, we should begin with prayer. So notice what he says in verse number 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Do you pray for other people? When you pray in your prayer time, how much of our prayer time is actually devoted to praying for another person and their need, their growth, their prosperity, what, what they're facing in their life. Pray for one another. So who should we pray for? Well, I think the first person you should pray for is your immediate family. So when I pray, I pray. Every time I pray, I pray for my wife. I almost feel that if I have not prayed for my wife, I have not completed prayer. Prayer begins with what is close to you. It begins, and this is, we're not to neglect our own soul. But as we begin to pray, we pray for the family, and we begin to work out from there. So I pray for my wife. I pray for her needs. I pray for her to be strong. I pray for her to love Christ and be faithful to Christ. I mean, we spend our lives together as husband and wives and nothing is going to change your spouse like your prayer is. Nothing is going to change the one that you love. And nothing is going to bring you to the one that God has for you like prayer. Prayer should also be for our children. We do so much sometimes as parents to provide. We sacrifice. We struggle. We think. We, we plan. How can I help my child to have a good life and to get ahead? But how much time do I spend praying for my children? How much time do I spend interceding for my children? Do you know their needs? Do you know where they're at and what they're facing? Do you know what it is that they're encountering? Are they a teen? Are they an adolescent? Are they a mature adult? What are the needs that they have? Are we praying for them to be protected and helped and blessed. Do we pray for our parents? Sometimes our parents are the ones that can have great needs. Do you realize that when men fall in the Bible, the majority of men who fall in the Bible fall in their mature years after they're 40? Now, doesn't mean you're mature if you're over 40, just as a way of dividing it there. But the Bible says that we should pray for those who are old so that they finish well so that they have a solid life, so that they go to their eternal home strong. Pray for your siblings. Pray for your extended family. Pray for your aunts and your uncles. Keep them in prayer because nothing is going to help them like prayer. But don't only pray for your family. Pray for your spiritual family. Did you know when the Bible talks about church, it uses terms like brothers and sisters. It speaks of God as your father, and it speaks of Jesus as the son. It uses family terms. And when you speak with your children about the Lord, you should always use church in a family way. So we have our immediate family, but we also have our spiritual family. And some of you are visiting and becoming part of this spiritual family. That's God's will. Jesus said, I will build my church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he is establishing local New Testament churches. So pray for me as your pastor. Nothing helps me as much as your prayers. Nothing helps me to prepare and to do the work of the ministry like consistent prayer for me and Beth and the triplets. You can influence the church through your prayers for a pastor. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look back in verse number 14. Notice he says of James 5, Is any sick among you, literally among yourselves? Is there one that is hurting? Is there one that is wounded and needs healing? Is there somebody that has a great need? Then we are to join together and we are to pray for that one among us who is sick. Pray for the the people in your church. Go through and pray individually. I do that regularly. I go through and I pray for every person which is in this church, even people that are visiting. Consistently, I do that because we are to pray for one another. And finally, pray for Ireland because that's where we now live. And the vast majority of us will spend our entire lives and the majority of us will actually die in Ireland. So pray for your country, pray for your citizens. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter two and verse number one. 1 Timothy chapter two and verse number one. The book of 1 Timothy chapter two, verse number one. I'll read it to you, but um, if you wanna look at it yourself, it's 1 Timothy chapter two and verse number one. I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, supplication, that means asking, prayers, intercession, that's where you're interceding, you're praying for another person. Intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice, we are to be the ones who are praying for the needs of our country. It is the prayers of God's people that determine what it is that God does to a large extent in a country. He says, pray, intercede for all men. But look at verse two, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. So we wanna live in a country that is ruled by law, that shows justice, that is not discriminatory. We wanna live in a country that is prosperous, and that has good leadership. But we must pray if we're going to have a good tea shack. We must pray if we're gonna have a responsible doll. We must pray if we're gonna have good courts and good guards. Pray for all that are in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Pray, pray for your family, pray for your church, pray for your country, pray, pray. Pray. Prayer changes us. As much as it changes these situations that we're able to influence through our prayer, we become the decider. And it brings us into a position of alignment with the will of God. Because to pray aright, I must pray according to his will. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I am to pray for his will. These are the prayers that change us. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 of of, um, James 5. Back in James chapter 5 and verse number 16. Notice what he's, notice the phrase, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The word availed is an old word which means to have force, unstoppable force. It means to have a power that cannot be quenched. It means to be unable to be withstood. It avails over a dominant force. It it avails because it is determining. How many of you saw the uh, footage of the tsunami in Japan? And some of the footage, when the, the wave came in, it took out everything that was in its path, a tragic accident or event. It took out the cars, it tumbled them like little rocks. It washed out the trees and the buildings and when the waves had receded, there was nothing. It just took everything. There was nothing that withstood it. There was a tsunami available to you, but not a tsunami which destroys, a tsunami which changes in a purposeful and intelligent way. The prayers of a godly man avail. 
they avail much, the Bible says. It changes, it transforms. It is absolutely a determinant in our world. But notice, secondly, the condition of a prayer, of a prayer that is answered. The condition of victorious prayer is that it must be hot and a fervent, and it must remain that way. Wouldn't you like to have a cup of tea that was always hot? I mean, you took the, you, you got your cup of tea, you put the milk in it, maybe you put a little sugar in it, and it just stayed hot. You came back three hours later, you came back two weeks later, and the cup was still hot. That's what effective prayer is like. It's hot, and it doesn't cool down. Remember when I was a boy, my parents gave me these sticks um, that were, it was like a wire, and it got a little bit thicker right after the part of wire that you held in your hand, and it was about, about like 16 inches long, or I don't know, about, a, about 30 centimeters long, and you would lit it, and it would sparkle beautifully, and you would remember you would wave it in the air and turn it around and do all kinds of things with it. That only lasted for a couple of minutes. When I went to university in Northwest Indiana near Chicago, they had firework stores. And in those stores, they had the grown-up version of that. That was a stick that had fire coming out of it. And that thing went on forever. I mean, you would wave it around and have a good time. You would make your circles. You would do all kinds of stuff. But then <laughs> you wanted to put it down, but you couldn't because it was burning and it was burning and it was burning. It was going on and on and on. The prayer that avails is a prayer that is intense. It is passionate. It is consuming. It has entered into the presence of God, and it has literally grabbed a hold of God, and it burns on and on and on. The word, the fervent effectual prayer, it actually is, the fervent effectual is one word. It's the tense of the word that gives it the concept of effectual. What it means is it is a, word, it is a continuous verb that continues on and on and on and on. Greek is very descriptive. So God is speaking of a prayer life that touches needs, that produces the miracle, that heals the wound, that encourages the soul, that sees the conviction set in upon a sinner, that sees the life change, that sees long-term change in their life. And he says that only comes about through the fervency of prayer through the intensity of prayer that persists on and on and on. So if my prayer is not answered, I have to ask myself, is my prayer fervent? Do I really want this prayer to be answered? I mean, will I, do I have a sense to where I will not be denied? I will not be limited. I will not be set back. I've come into the presence of my Father, and I have a need that is consuming that is eating me up, and I am simply bringing that need to my Father, and I am passionate about that need. I'm praying to my Father, and he's availing, he's availing, he's availing. Notice next with me that if prayer is to be answered, it's, it's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous heart, a righteous man that avails much. There's no need for us to ask God to bless our enemies if we continue to hold hatred in our heart, it doesn't help. There's no need to ask God to bless our finances if we're too selfish to give a tithe. It doesn't help. Look at Psalm 66 and verse number 18. Psalm chapter 66 and verse number 18. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalms 66 and verse number 18. If I regard or I give attention to, if I allow iniquity, that is sin, to remain in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You see, to pray effectively, to have prayer that avails, I must come into his presence. It is the effectual prayer of a righteous man that avails much. Righteousness is the foundation of effective prayer. I must pray to my Father from a righteous heart. Many prayers are not answered until the sin is confessed, until we have turned and we are trusting in our Father, until we're seeking from a righteous heart and answer from a righteous God. So if I regard iniquity, the Bible tells me that he will not hear me. 
But before there can be righteousness in practice, there must be righteousness in standing. Through salvation, we become righteous in God's, in God's sight, not on the basis of our life, but on the basis of what Christ has done for us. I am then to pursue a life of righteousness. And as righteousness and not sin characterizes my life, that becomes my practice. So there is a position of righteousness and there is the practice of righteousness. He's speaking of both in this verse. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or of a righteous woman, it avails, it transforms, it changes. It brings that lasting, satisfying change to a life. But it has to come from someone who has the right position. My, Andrew, my son Andrew tries to be a good son, not to be born into my family. He has already been born in to the family. That is his position. And now his practice is to be a good son. That's what a saved person, a believer, does. But before we can get to that place, we ourselves must be saved. Look back with me in Romans chapter 4 and verse number 1. Look in Romans chapter 4 and verse number 1. Speaking of prayer, Romans chapter 4 and verse number 1. All right, some of us are a little sleepy. It's a little warm in here. So we've got a nice... Nice feel in our bellies. All right, stick with me just for a couple minutes. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 4, verse number 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Now he's talking about Abraham. Why would he talk about Abraham? What is it about Abraham that would be interesting? I mean, why would we consider Abraham? Because Abraham is the foundation of the Jewish nation, which gave us our law, our prophets, our, the word of God, but also it brought forth the Savior. The Savior came out of it. And Abraham is the key figure. It's his grandson and their 12 sons that become the nation. So he says, what shall we then say of Abraham? So when he said that, or wrote this, Paul did to the Jews, and they read it, their ears would perk up. Abraham, well, Abraham, he's the big man in the Old Testament, along with Moses along with David and Isaiah, Abraham. Well, what did Abraham do to become justified? What shall we then say of Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh? What did he find? Verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by his works, he hath where of the glory, but not before God. There's that word again, justified. Look at verse 2. Look at the fifth word. For if Abraham were justified. Do you remember we talked about this, that this morning? What does the word justified mean? Justified means not that you have no guilt. It's not that you're innocent. It's not that you haven't done anything wrong. No, justified simply means that your fine has been paid. You have served the time. You have paid the fine. You have done what is required. You have fulfilled the penalty. And therefore, you're justified. You're declared to be righteous in the eyes of the law. The law has no more hold, no more grip in your life. You are justified. You're fine. Your time has been served. Your fine has been paid. So verse 2, if Abraham were justified in the sight of God, if the penalty of his sin was satisfied, if he were made righteous by works, he hath where of the glory, but not before God. So if he were justified that way, well, he could glory, but not before God, because God has perfect righteousness. And Abraham's righteousness, which he would try and get through his works, because we all either try and become righteous by our works or by our faith, he says it's not before God. The Bible says that sin keeps us from righteousness. We sin constantly. We sin in the past, in the present, in the future. We sin by the way that we think sometimes. We sin by the things that we are doing or plan on doing, what we plan on having that maybe God has forbidden or God says we cannot or should not have. We, we sin sometimes by the acts that we take. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory. Look with me in Romans chapter 3. So flip back one chapter, Romans chapter 3 and verse number 10. So he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, 
No, not one. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you see that? Look in your Bible, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written. Like that's the whole Bible. It's conclusive. All of the Bible says it is written. It is written. It is written over and over and over again. It is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. Verse 23, all have sinned, and they've come short of God's law. So we could define sin as anything I think, anything I say, or anything I do that breaks God's law, that transgresses his law. So if Abraham were justified by works, he could glory, but not before God. The point is simple. If Abraham cannot justify himself, if Abraham cannot make himself righteous, by his life and by his works, what chance do you or I have? What does our glory aim then of our own righteousness? It is Christ that has died and resurrected. Look what he says in verse number three. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was credited unto him for righteousness. Isn't that glorious? Abraham believed the promises of God and God credited to his soul perfect righteousness. God does the same thing in, your, in my life as long as I'm not coming to the point of faith because I'm busy trying to obtain, trying to be good enough. I'm going through the rituals of religion maybe. I'm going my own way. Maybe I've determined my own path and my own um, way of getting to heaven or being good enough. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him righteousness, perfect righteousness, divine righteousness. As good as you are and as, as good a life as you have lived, it will never provide the perfect righteousness that God requires of you. You need perfect, 100% righteousness. And your life and your works, what you say and what you do, number one, it's not perfectly righteous and it cannot take away the sin of the past or the present or the future. That sin is before you. Abraham believed in God. He trusted in what he provided, and God credited righteousness to him. So instead of trying works, he believed. So it brings you and I to that crossroads again. Either we have been made righteous by the works that we do, the words that we speak, or the life that we live. Either that makes me righteous, or it has nothing to do with my salvation. Nothing I have done, nothing I have done, I'm doing or will do makes me righteous. I'm made righteous by faith alone. Now that cuts because it means that all of our attempts, all of the deeds and works that we have done do nothing to make us righteous before God. Nothing. I am made completely righteous by faith alone with nothing added or nothing take, taken away. So either I can pay for my sins, I can try and work for my sins, or I can trust in what Christ has provided. Now look what it says in verse number four. Look at Romans, Romans chapter five, verse four and verse number four. Romans four, verse number four. Now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if we're going to go down the path of saying, well, I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to obtain it. I'm going to live. I'm going to be. I'm going to have this kind of life. Then it's not going to be God's grace. We have taken it upon ourselves to atone and cover our sin. It's going to be debt. Working, working, working. It produces a debt. And if we have the debt, we are no longer in the realm of grace. God is unbelievably holy and righteous, and he will not allow our puny little righteousness 
to stand. It cannot stand. That is why he has provided the son. It is why he has provided a savior. It is so that your righteousness can be complete. He wants to credit his perfect righteousness to you and to your account. But to him that worketh not, look at verse 5, Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5, but to him that worketh not, to him that worketh not, he's given up. He's not trying. He's not trying. He knows he can't be. That's no longer his way of approach. That's no longer how he's going about it. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, there it is, justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. When I have quit working and I have begun to believe on him who declares me righteous, he who justifies, he who pays my fine, that's Jesus on the cross. He's justifying, he's paying your fine. He that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Are you willing this afternoon, today, to come outside of what you have always believed, of what you've always thought, of the way that you have always approached God and maybe even always approached the Bible? And are you willing to say, it is by faith? Look at verse five. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, O oh, his faith, that faith is credited for righteousness. Today, we have a choice. Today before you is a road. And the Bible says that this seed, it's planted, it's precious, and it speaks of it being snatched away while you're within the hearing of the gospel. If God is calling to you and he is convicting you and showing you that your righteousness is insufficient, it will leave you short. It will leave you um, unable to atone for your sin. It will leave you in debt. If he is speaking to you this morning, he is drawing you out. He is pulling you to the place of faith, of dependence upon Jesus Christ so that he can credit his righteousness to your account. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, that's the faith that's credited, that brings about righteousness in your life. Today, have we believed? Have we come to the place of saving faith? We know perhaps a lot of the Bible. We know many things about the Bible, but we still haven't come to that place of believing in Christ, of depending on Christ. We haven't come to that place of staking ourselves on Christ alone, alone. It is not Hope Baptist Church. It is not the church that you may have been to or are going to. It is Christ alone. That is my righteousness. That is my standing. That is what brings me into his presence. My friend, trust the Bible. It is so clear. All it will do is argue, explain, and illustrate that one point, that you have your sin. The Bible hath concluded all are under sin. Abraham believed in God, and God credited righteousness to his account. If you will at this moment believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will come to the place in your life of trusting solely in Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection as the payment for your sin, God will give you his righteousness. He will give you his righteousness. That is what he will bring to you. But to him, that worketh not. It's conditional. Either I'm going to be made righteous by my works and the way I live, or I'm going to be made righteous by faith alone. Sola fide, it is the scripture. The scripture has declared that you and I 
can be made righteous only through faith in Christ alone. Where are you today? Have you, in your heart, spoken to God and told him that you know that you have sinned? You've repented in a sense. There's a change of mind, and you're looking outside of yourself to the perfect substitute. Perfect. I mean, it is perfect. It is completely atoned for your sin. It is absolute. Every sin, past and present and future, all of your sin, it is Jesus Christ. It is his atonement. It is his death. It is him dying in your place. And you're looking outside of yourself to that cross. You're coming. Come to the cross. Don't stop here. Some of you understand and you know what the Bible is saying. And I'm encouraging you, come that little bit further. Come that, that little bit more to that place of faith alone. That, just that little bit more to that faith alone. You know and you understand. You see it. But now come to faith alone, in Jesus alone, as a forgiveness for your sin. You come to that place of Jesus alone and faith alone, right there. That's where it's at. That's the heart of it. Don't come short of it. Don't miss it now. Come to the place of faith alone and let him save you. Come to that point. Don't turn. Don't miss. Don't miss it now. Faith alone and Jesus alone. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you could pray with me for just a minute. Salvation is that close. Is infinitely deep, but it is that close. Come to that place of refuge, that place of safety. Come to faith alone, in Jesus alone. Say it right now to yourself in your prayer. Speak to God and say, God, my sin. I've been living a works life, trying to obtain my righteousness, through the life that I live, what I'm doing, what I'm saying. No, it's faith alone, in Jesus alone. I'm trusting in his complete payment for my sin on the cross right now. I'm staking everything on Jesus Christ. That if his death atoned for my sin, that I am secure, his death, has, has completely paid for my sin. I'm staking it all on that, that I am righteous in your sight. I am going to heaven, never because of what I've done or the life that I've lived, but because of what Jesus accomplished on that cross so many years ago, that he paid for your sin, made of the seed of a woman to redeem you. Pray that prayer right now. God, I know. I know that I have sinned. And I know that the way that I've lived or will live cannot take away my sin. And right now, I am claiming Jesus Christ. I am trusting in his death and that resurrection. That was the proof that he actually atoned for your sin. I'm trusting in his death that he was God, that he atoned for my sin. He covered my sin. Pray that prayer right now. Come that little bit more. Trust in him right now. Come that little bit and believe on him and he'll save you. He will gloriously save you. Pray that prayer, God. I know that I have sin. I've transgressed law. As it is written, there is none righteous. Lord, I know that. And I am depending now I have come to the place of depending upon Jesus Christ. That's me. Can you say that? That's me. That's me. That's me. I'm praying and trusting in Jesus alone. Praying that in the quietness of this moment, do it. Ask him to come into your heart and save you.